Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the Prepper Dog series. This is episode 10, why I chose the Malazar breed for Doomsday. So for those of you not familiar with what the term analogy Malazar means, it's an ancient breed of dog that's commonly considered to be the ancestors of today's Mastiff dogs. So Mastiff type dogs were often really referred to as Malazar or Malasus dogs. It's one of the best known breeds of the Greco-Roman antiquity. The Malazar dogs were traditionally used for guarding livestock and also used for war, and then smaller versions were used for hunting. And depending on the school of thought that you come from, many believe that this dog actually started in ancient Albania and then were adopted by the ancient Greeks. And then others believe that it started and originated in you know the ancient Greek Empire and then was spread out through the rest of the world. And there's really good literature and historical references for either one being accurate. Um, we can see based upon historic references and literature that um, the Malazar dogs were in both places during similar times. And obviously this video isn't going to be an authority on where the dog originated from, but the fact that the dog does have a rich history and very strong traits that make them Malazars, you know, and I think it's a great rich history and for me there's no doubt in my mind that I want to have a Malazar breed for Doomsday for the end of the world for when shit hits the fan and in this conversation I'm going to talk about you know my thought process going in and why I ultimately chose a Malazar breed dog for the end of the world so I hope you guys like the video like the video I hope you guys like this conversation let's get started so for those of you guys that already know I have a English Bull Mastiff mix her name is Kova. She's 11 months old and she's a little over 120 pounds. And so for the remainder of this conversation, I'm just going to refer to this, these breeds, Mastiffs in general, as Malazar because I want to be the most politically correct in regards to the traits that I'm looking for. And so that's why I'll be using that terminology. But my dog, like I said, is the English Bull Mastiff mix. So the first things first, I need to decide and figure out what it is I'm looking for and what tasks do I expect my dog to perform. And by tasks, I mean what's my dog going to be doing day to day? Like what are the main tasks I, I need it to do? And so, you know, for me, it's, it's quite simple. Number one, I need a guard dog. Number two, I need a livestock guardian. Number three, I need a loyal companion animal. And four, if the situation arises... I need a personal protection dog, a dog that is going to do what's necessary to protect my family, my livestock, myself from a violent assault. So there are lots of dogs, obviously, that can do all these, all these tasks that I'm, I'm looking for. But for me, I believe the Malazar fits perfectly into the mold of what it is that I'm looking for for the following reasons. So what am I looking for exactly in a guard dog? Well, I'm looking for a dog, like I said before, that's going to protect my family, my property, myself, my animals. I need a dog that is going to be able to put themselves in harm's way. So then now I have to figure out, well, what does harm's way look like? Harm's way looks different for me living out in the country on a piece of property than it would be for somebody that you know lives in a city or even a suburb. There are going to be different threats. There are going to be different types of predation, etc. So the first thing that I did is I looked into my local crime statistics, my crime stats, um, both for neighboring municipalities, you know, the closest cities, and then for where I'm at countywide. And I found something very interesting. I noticed that property crimes are extremely high. So property crime can be anything from, you know, theft, burglary, um, defacing property, damaging property, that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of those tend to be drug related. The drugs of choices here in my in my state and especially my county are black tar heroin and methamphetamines. And I know based upon my training experience that people that are under the influences of those types of drugs and or narcotics tend to not think rationally um, tend to get agitated very easily, and a lot of times they're desperate. You know, they live in this perpetual state of trying to get to the next high. So their rationale and decision making can be severely altered. So the next thing I noticed is that 
you know, violent crimes are also um, very prevalent. So we're looking at anything from, you know, assaults, domestic violence, that kind of thing. So what I'm looking at, when I'm looking at what my dog might come in contact with when we're talking about the human element, it could be somebody that's very high on methamphetamines that is desperate to get their next fix. And that could cause a huge problem for myself and especially for whatever dog that I have that is expected to perform and is expected to protect me and my family. And so when I'm looking at this, I notice that I want a dog that's very capable of guarding a piece of property and be able to take on one, two, three, you know, people that are habitual users of methamphetamines. And so I find the Malazar breed to be a very capable and very command present dog that, you know, on face value, you know, you see a large Malazar dog on the other side of the fence looking at you. Um, that dog letting you know their command presence, that may, you know, deter somebody from deciding to take advantage of a situation. But if not, I feel very confident that a Malazar breed of dog can handle themselves against, you know, one, two, even three potential, you know, attackers or vandals. So I think that that's something to look at. And it may not work for everybody in every situation, but here in a situation where I'm in the country on a homestead, you know, I want the Malazar dog to take on those individuals that are high on methamphetamines that are pulling up in their pickup trucks looking to cause myself, my family, or my property harm. So next, livestock guardian. What makes a good livestock guardian? Well, a couple things. You need a dog that is going to play nice with your livestock animals. I think that's a given. And then you need a dog that has a vested interest and actually wants to look after your property, wants to look after your livestock, and knows knows its boundaries. If you have a dog that's prone to wander off, well, guess what? They're, they're, they don't make a good livestock guardian because they're not there. They're not physically there to defend your livestock or to defend your property, which means they're not there to defend you and your family. So that's that's one thing. Next thing is what kind of predation do you see happening to your livestock animals, right? So I'll give you a few examples. In my area, we have black bears, wolves, coyotes, foxes, cougars, weasels, fishers, badgers, etc., raccoons, possums. So we do have predator animals that have a very high motive and a very high drive to come on the property and, you know, mess with the quail, the rabbits, the goats, the chickens, the turkeys, cows, etc. So knowing that I have these types of predators to, to watch out for and to be wary of, now I need a livestock guardian that I feel confident and capable to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a wolf, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a coyote. And so that's that's super important. And so when I take all these culmination of different uh, hierarchy of needs here, I need a livestock guardian that's going to play well with my livestock animals, one that's not prone to wander off, and one that I feel confident can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a wolf. Um, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a black bear. Let them know that, hey, I'm over here and you are not welcome. I can't think of a better breeded dog to do that than a Malazar breed dog. Now, don't get me wrong. There are other great livestock guardians out there you know there's other dogs that do great with livestock even if you look at your cattle dogs stuff like that they do really good with livestock but in the area that I'm at you know they may not be the best animal to confront they may not be the best dog to confront that wolf you know what I mean they may not be the best dog to confront that coyote or that black bear so I need a dog that can sit on the other side of the fence and look over and let and have that command presence and let that predator know you need to go somewhere else. Another thing to take take into consideration when you're talking about livestock guardians and guard dogs in general is the you know the barking. Some dogs are great watchdogs, right? Which can be great guard dogs, especially if you are in the city. Maybe you want that dog that's going to be that early warning system that's gonna bark, 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 let them know, hey, I'm here, I'm here. A lot of livestock guardians aren't that type of watchdog. I can tell you with, you know, with uh, the Moiser breeds and other livestock guardians, your larger live livestock guardians, they tend to blend in very well, and they don't let their presence known until they want you to let, they want you to know they're there. And trust me, they know that they they know that that you're there. You may not see them, but they definitely see you. 
And so I think that's great because, like I said, it makes that stance of command presence, okay? If you're coming up, whether you're a predator or you're a person, and you're looking to do nefarious things, and you come up on the property, and then you have a, you know, 120-plus pound, you know, Malazar Mastiff looking at you, you know, that's going to that's gonna kind of throw a wrench in your plan. And then once you hear that aggressive bark, you know, that's perfect. That's great. That's what I'm looking for in a livestock guardian. So I want a dog that can, like I said, play nice with my with my livestock, want to defend my lot livestock, want to defend my property, is not prone to wander off and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those bigger predators. And I think the Malazar breeds do a great job in that. I can't think of a better breed for that purpose. Next, I want a companion animal. I need a dog that is going to be patient, compassionate, loyal, loving. I want a dog that wants to be with its people. You know, I want a dog that will be by my side, that will be laying down next to my feet, and then if something arises or something happens or something goes thud in the night, I want that dog to be up, ready to go, and its only thing on its mind is I want to protect this family. And, you know, there's not a lot of dogs that are necessarily like that or even have the ability to be that way. But Malazar breed dogs... That describes them perfectly. If you if you have been around them, or if you're somebody that has ever owned a Malazar breed, you know that without a shadow of a doubt, they are some of the most loving, best gentle giants out there. And so, for this purpose, I think they're perfect for you know a family dog for myself. And you know, we'll kind of go on. We'll kind of talk about this you know later on in this discussion. But you know, I need a dog that can be inside, that can be outside. I need a dog that it wants to be around its people and wants to be loved on by its people and wants to protect its people no matter what the cost. And again, I can't think of a better breed of dog for me than the Malazar breeds. Now let's talk about personal protection. When I mean personal protection, I mean if the incident arises, the dog is willing to defend itself or defend you using some sort of force, whether that means pinning somebody down, biting, etc. So basically what we're talking about is a situation where the dog is willing to use force. And so with that comes training. You know, if you expect your dog just to be able to bite or tackle on command, that's, you know, that's, that's really just uh, <laughs> you watching too many movies. Now, I have seen, I have seen it, and I have seen it firsthand where a dog that's not bite trained um, has defended itself or defended its owner um, in a high stress situation and that's totally possible there are dogs out there that that can do that but generally speaking you know it's something that needs to be trained and it's something that should be trained if you are expecting your dog to do it or wanting your dog to do it you know the training is definitely super important to you know to do and to keep current on with me I am training my dog currently uh, we're, we're bite training her and she, you know, being a Malazar breed, she takes to it very well. Uh, she's very natural for her, and it, it's good for that muscle memory. Like I said, um, this is important because if the situation ever arrives, I don't want that real-life situation to be the first time that dogs had to defend itself or defend somebody else. You know, I want that dog to have confidence knowing that it can tackle, it can bite, it can fight back, it has fought back in training. You know, your training exercises, like anything else we do, should be you know, high octane, you know, you want your training to be more intense than the real thing, um, preferably, right? And so I have, you know, confidence that with the continued training, you know, it's going to make, um, it's going to make our dog better at all the aforementioned things we talked about, a better guard dog, a better livestock guardian, better companion dog, the dog's going to understand me better, I'm going to understand the dog better, um, there's going to be that, that trust that's built through hard work, sweat, and merit. And so, yeah, I think that's super important, but it's something that, you know, I have to stay on top of, and it's something that I have to spend a lot of time, energy, and resources in, in doing. And for me, based upon, you know, the, the aforementioned things we've talked about, I think the best dog for me in the situation that I'm currently at and for what I'm doing, um, I believe it's the Malazar breed dogs. Like I said, um, they're, they're in a class all of their own, and for what I'm needing them to do, and for what I'm asking of them to do, and for the tasks that they will be performing, like I said, I can't choose a better type of dog than the Malazar. So let's talk about skill set and time. 
Um, growing up, I grew up with a lot of type A personality dogs, um, German Shepherds, Pit Bulls. So I feel pretty confident in my ability to train and to effectively communicate with them. And that's the biggest thing when it comes to training a dog, especially one that is a type A personality, is effective communication, consistent and persistent training, and then couple that with good leadership. And, you know, that that's really what it comes down to and having the time to do that. And luckily enough for me, um, God has blessed me and he's put me on this earth to prepare and to take care of my family. And so, you know, that's that's where my time is. My time is ensuring that I can prepare and I can provide for my family. So I have the time and the skill set necessary to ensure that I can do the aforementioned things and that I can prepare my dog to, to, to be ready, you know, should the incident happen or should we be placed in a situation where shit has hit the fan. And for the Malazar type breed dogs, they, they do need that. They need that good leader. They need consistent training, you know, and they need a good communicator. Um, they are, you know, they are type A personality dogs. They are very strong willed. Um, some can even say that they're stubborn. So yeah, they need a good leader and they need an effective communicator. So I think uh, that this, you know, is a great fit because I can be a little hard headed too. So yeah, as far as skill set and time goes, you know, this dog is, is perfect for my situation. All right, let's talk about infrastructure. So for my infrastructure, I'm on a homestead on some acreage and I have fencing, but it's cattle wire. So even a large breed dog like a Malazar can get underneath it if they really wanted to. So that's something to consider in my instance. And like I said before, um, I need a dog that is going to want to stay on the property, want to defend the property, want to be around its people, want to be around its livestock. And so, you know, if you don't have that, then yeah, you have the ability for, you know, your dog to wander off. And who knows what could happen if your dog wanders off. That could be very dangerous. In the cities, you don't really have that problem. is not really as big of a consideration because most cities or suburbs, you're going to have a fenced area for, you know, for your yard. So that's not as big of an issue as, you know, somebody that's on acreage property with, you know, cattle wire. So I need a dog that's going to, like I said, stay on the property, want to stay on the property, want to be around his people, want to be around his tribe. And so luckily enough for me, the Malaz breed of dogs perfect for, for that instance um, and, and that situation. Next, we got to look at, um, you know, do we have the proper equipment for continued training and for housing? And so if I'm wanting a dog and I really believe my dog are going to be doing the aforementioned things, you know, guarding, livestock guarding, companion, personal protection, then I need to have a setup where the dogs can be inside and outside. So that means, you know, I have to have pins, I have to have kennels, I have to have equipment and infrastructure set up for them to do both, you know. And so that's something that you should take into consideration. That's something that I have to take into consideration, um, which I have. You know, I, I have kennels and I have other infrastructure for them to be inside and for them to be outside. Next, we need to look at uh, the equipment. Like I said, if you really believe, and I really believe that, you know, my dog could be in a situation where, you know, it may have to use force, then, you know, okay, great. So what are you going to do with the with equipment, like a bite sleeve? You know, that's a great example. Collars, leashes. Do I have extra? Do I have them on hand? So that's something that I have to take a look at. That, is that something, and lastly, you know, not just do you have it, is that something that you are going to want to keep on, on top of and want to, you know, always be thinking about and always having on hand? For me, the answer is absolutely. That, that's an absolute yes. Um, next, medical gear, you know, that's super important. Do I have a medical gear? If I expect my dog to be in harm's way, then I have to, you know, be prepared in case, you know, there's injury either to myself or to, or to my to my livestock or to my dog. So I need to make sure that I have the medical gear and it's prepped and it's ready. And most importantly, that I have the training. For those of you guys that, that know, know me, know my channel, you guys know that I was a Naval Hospital Corpsman for over 10 years, combat medic for, for those of you that are unfamiliar with what the Naval Hospital Corpsman does. So yes, I've had training and I've had specialized training for dogs and uh, I feel very confident in my ability to, um, to prep medical gear for dogs and to use the medical gear appropriately. Next, with infrastructure, we need to start talking about SOPs. Like I said, if I really truly believe in my heart of hearts 
that there is a situation or there could be an event that arises where my dog will have to use force, well then I have to have SOPs for what am I going to do when that dog, you know, comes in contact with somebody. So great example, I'm, on, I'm in the pasture doing chores, somebody that's a habitual user of methamphetamines comes on the property for nefarious purposes. Let's say this person wants to rob me or wants to hurt my family. Well, I have an expectation because I've trained my dog that he's going to go and make contact or she's going to go and make contact with that person, which is going to result in one of two things happening, that person getting away or that person not getting away. So if the person is unable to get away, well, then he's going to be pinned on the ground with a very large mastiff on top of him or her, um, preventing, preventing that escape. So do I have the infrastructure? Do I have the skill set and do I have the ability to take custody of that person, perform a search incident to custody, all that stuff? The answer is yes, I have that training and I, I can do that. Do I have the infrastructure to house that person until law enforcement arrives? Yes, I do. I have infrastructure to house somebody um, that I detain. Do I have the infrastructure to house somebody and transport that person in case this happens? Yes, I do. Um, do I have a protocol and SOP set up for if this is truly a shit hits the fan off grid situation and I can't contact law enforcement? The answer is yes, I do have an SOP and I do have a plan for that and I do have the equipment and I do have the skill set and training to do that. So those are actual real life applications that I need to be prepared for if I plan to have this type of dog and this has got to be something that I have to be willing to do and somebody that's prepared minded, yes, it's something that you know was taken care of before, way before I got the dog. Do I have the infrastructure and skills set up for predator disposal, whether that is a, you know, whether that is, you know, a predator animal that is injured, killed, do I have a, do I have policy set up, do I have protocol set up for disposal? Yes, I do. Do I know the right paperwork, state paperwork that would need to be filed if applicable? Yes, I do. Do I know where I need to turn that paperwork in if it's applicable? Yes, I do. So these are all things that, you know, I need to think about. And for those of you that are wanting to have, you know, they're wanting to live this lifestyle or wanting or expecting to come in contact with these type of events, that's something that you need to have, you know, ready on hand and know exactly what you're going to do. So as far as infrastructure goes, you know, I have infrastructure to house, you know, livestock. I'm on acreage. You know, and I have a dog that could be performing these these duties, and you know the incidents of use of force could arise. And I do feel equipped and ready to handle those. And if I do come in contact where I need to use force, I have full trust in the Malazar breed that it will do what it's designed to do, and with the training that I that I am ongoing, um, that that dog will perform. So let's talk about food preparedness, and I'm just going to be 100% honest with you guys. Malazar breeds, they eat a lot of food. There's no doubt about that. They have a very high food requirement. Um, they have very unique caloric profiles, which need to be mapped out. They have um, a high nutrient requirement, which I've created data sheets with breakdowns of what they need numerically. And uh, you have to really consider what your current food storage setup is and also have a resupply plan for your dog because you know if you really believe that you're going to be you know surviving here at the end of the world and shit hits the fan you need to be able to operate at current demand indefinitely and so being that you know if we're really talking about having a dog for the end of the world when shit hits the fan and you need to have that that companion animal that companion dog that's going to do the aforementioned things i want i really had to prioritize how important was all the aforementioned you know Honestly, I had to ask myself, Millennial, how important is it to have a guard dog that can protect you against multiple assailants um, that are high on methamphetamines or heroin? How important is it to have a livestock guardian that can actually be effective at preventing predation against known predators in the area? You know, including, you know, black bears, wolves, coyotes, foxes, that kind of thing. How important is it to have an animal that can, a dog that can do those things, provide, for, you know, personal protection, and also be a companion animal? Like, really what it comes down to is how much of a priority is it to have a dog that can do all those things? Because when it comes to feeding them, that's, that's huge. 
most people cannot feed a Malazu breed dog. It's just, you know, without, I mean, obviously they can by buying kibble, commercial commercial kibble, but most people do not have the infrastructure and ability set up to um, resupply plan their dog in case the end of the world happens. Like, for the majority of people that have these breeds, breeds of dog, if all food supply chains were cut off, most people would not be able to feed their dog. That's just a reality. And it's not just for Malazu breeds, it's pretty much for all breeds. Most people do not have that ability. But, being that I'm not everybody else and that this is, you know, this is important to me and preparedness is something that I take seriously, um, how important is it to have a dog that can do all those things? And for me, um, it was it was simply, it is the most important thing. I have to adjust and I have to adapt. And so essentially that's that's what I've done. There's there's no doubt about it. The dog requires a lot of food. These dogs do require a lot of food. They require a lot of uh, you know nutrient and dense food. And if you guys want to see, you know, go go to go to my channel. You can see, you know, go to look at my other videos. You can see how I feed my dogs. You can see, you know, how I how I prep for that. But you know, gr you know, living on a homestead, growing my own food, I'm in a unique position where I can set aside animals, breeding animals, just for my dog. You know what I mean? Like I have I have rabbits designated that their litters are for, you know, feeding my dog. And so I have made and I have adjusted for that, but I'd be lying to you if I said that it was a it was a quick, easy fix because it's not. But when it comes to food preparedness, you know, it, it takes a lot of work um, and it takes a lot of research, but ultimately having a dog that can do the aforementioned things and do them effectively and efficiently um, is the most important thing. So when it comes to food preparedness, I had to adjust to the dog. And so, you know, that's what I did and I'm very happy about it. But yes, they do require a lot of food and that's definitely uh, one of the considerations that I had to think, you know, I had to think about before, you know, making the decision. So let's talk about talk about water preparedness for a second. Dogs require approximately eight and a half to seventeen ounces of water per ten pounds of dog, and this is going to depend on a few factors. It's going to depend on activity level. It's going to depend on elevation. It's going to depend on weather, climate. It's going to depend on the kind of food that they're intaking. So there's a lot of different factors that you know that are going to go into you know determining that. But let's just take my dog. She's eleven months over 120 pounds, so let's round up to 130 pounds of dog. So my dog can consume, you know, on an active hot day, you know, up to 1.7 gallons of water. So this is something that I have to think about and I have to prepare for. Now I'm, you know, blessed and lucky that I have, you know, water resupply plan of having a well, river access with a pump, and rain catchment systems. I have a 55 gallon IBC tote that I, ha I keep full at all times. So that would give me, if all water sources were unavailable for whatever reason, 30 days initial water survival time for my dog to figure out what I'm going to do next. Um, but at current loads and demands for all my livestock that I have, you know, I can operate at current demand indefinitely. So while water is not very pivotal in the grand scheme of things, it is something that I'm always thinking about. It's something that I ensure that, you know, I monitor because you know, like I said, these dogs do require a lot of food and they do require a lot of water compared to a smaller dog like, let's say, your 50-pound American Staffordshire Terrier. You know, so these uh, these requirements are going to be a bit elevated for the Malazar breed. Um, but if you have, you know, a little bit of foresight, you can mitigate a lot of those a lot of those concerns. So overall, I have a plan, and uh, I obviously they consume a lot of water, but in the grand scheme of things, kind of with the food preparedness item that I mentioned earlier, um, the priority is to have a dog that can guard both, you know, my property, my family, my livestock, can protect me, my family, my livestock, and also be a good companion animal. That takes priority, so I'll make sure that the water requirement is met. So let's talk about some other considerations. I'm going to mention food one more time. Malazu breeds require a lot of food. Depending on their size, they can easily consume six pounds or more, six pounds plus a day, no problem. Um, and that's a highly dense raw food. So having a food plan is a must. And like I said before, I had to really prioritize. And when it came down to it, um, I had to ask myself how important and how much of a priority was it to have a, a guard dog, a livestock guardian, a companion animal, 
and personal protection dog that can defend against multiple assailants that are high on methamphetamines and bigger uh, livestock predation of you know bears, wolves, and coyotes. And you know, for me, it's a no-brainer. The Malazer takes the takes the cake, so to speak. They would be what I most trust in in that type of situation. So, you know, you have to make the you have I have to plan the food around them and around their needs. So that was something that I did and I addressed. Another thing to keep in mind: purebreds can be very expensive. I remember when I was first looking for um, once I had committed and knew I wanted to get a Malazer breed, I was looking at English Mastiffs, and uh, I remember talking to a lady who's been in the show arena. Um, she is a uh, a, a judge for the AKC and she's been breeding English Mastiffs for I think her family's been doing it for over 30 years and she pretty much told me you know if you're spending anything under three thousand dollars for English Mastiff you're doing it wrong and uh, to you know to some respect she was you know absolutely right I mean English Mastiffs are you know they're very expensive and you know you're gonna pay for the higher quality dog, the higher quality uh, genetics, the certifications for, for example, hips with OFA, that kind of thing. So yeah, they can be very expensive. Um, and that, and this goes to say with all, you know, with all pedigree dogs, they tend to be more expensive. Another thing to keep in mind, purebred dogs can be prone to cancer, um, CBD, cardiovascular disease, um, JVD, or GVD, gastric issues, um, obviously hips and eye problems. So like I said, every pedigree breed, all dogs can have, you know, underlying health concerns and health history, but in uh, purebred dogs, you know, those are easier to, to see, you know, up front what could be problems in the future. So keep that in mind. Um, Malazer breeds are very powerful dogs, and they require, they re they require strong leadership. Um, strong leadership, good communication. You know, a lot of people say they can be stubborn, um, but maybe that that's why we get along so well because I guess I could be stubborn too. But they do require um, you to be a strong leader. Another thing to keep in mind, um, they may not be big barkers. They may not be, you know, the early warning system that you might that you might think or expect from a dog. I know with uh, with with my dog, she. You know, she will stalk. You know, she, if she sees something, she will go investigate. It doesn't mean that she's barking and yapping all the way there, but if she sees something that, you know, is you know, out of the normal, she goes investigates. You know, if a if a car pulls up into the, you know, up into the through the gate and she doesn't recognize it, she'll go make contact. She won't go, you know, chasing it, barking like that. But she will use that command presence. She'll make herself known and she will go investigate. Hey, who are you? Why are you here? So, you know, keep that in mind. They may not be big barkers, and if you're wanting a dog that's going to be a barker and, you know, alert to everything, you know, the Malazer breed may not be for you. Another thing to keep in mind is they're not very trusting of strangers, at least the ones that, I, that, that I've met and the one, the one that I have. My dog, she's not very trusting of strangers. Um, that doesn't mean that she's going to be aggressive or, or mean towards somebody that she doesn't know. She's very well socialized, but a Malazer breeds in general aren't very trusting to people that they don't know to complete strange to complete strangers and that's just comes with the programming of the breed which I think is very good um, and I, I respect that you know it, it's how we should be having that command presence and that alertness that situational awareness you know be nice to everybody you meet but you know have a plan for things go south and I think that's a great rule to live by and it, to, these breeds are intuitively um, like that Another thing to keep in mind, based upon their size and command presence, like I mentioned earlier, they may alienate themselves and you from other people. I know when I take my dog into town, yes, there, there are times where I will go and I'll be walking her down the street and people purposefully will walk across the street and go the other way. That just comes with, that, that comes with the territory. They are a very big and intimidating dog and that may alienate people from you. Now, there are people that will come up to you and want to talk to you, ask you about your dog and you know, pet, you know, pet them and stuff like that, which is great. But there are a lot of people, you know, that will purposefully go out of the way to get away from you. Me personally, I like that. That makes me happy. Um, but you know, if it does, and if you're, you know, if you're living in a in a in a big city or suburb where you kind of have to, you know, you're expected to not have a dog that that's that is that intimidating, or having a dog that intimidating can cause problems. You really might want to reconsider. Um, 
the Malazar Bridge because, like I said, they do have a command presence that demands respect and uh, that can alienate you from your, your peers, neighbors, and, and other people. And when you go to the dog park, you've seen the same thing. People have purposely picking their dogs up and because dogs are naturally curious and they'll purposely pick their dog up and like no we're out of here or pull their dog away like I don't want you playing with my dog because you know your dog looks intimidating it looks mean and people just don't understand so keep that in mind um, it's not something like I said that I'm necessarily upset about or worried about but like I said everybody's situation is different me being out in the country um, on a homestead, you know, it, that doesn't bother me at all. In fact, that's that's one of the great reasons, one of the many reasons why, why I respect the breed even more. So after, you know, deciding that we were going to go with the Malazar breed, another consideration that I had that I needed to figure out was if I was going to get a male or female. And having grown up, you know, only with having male dogs in the past, I, you know, naturally was inclined to get a male, you know, obviously they're larger, I saw them as more enterprising, you know, more of a go-getter, and so, you know, that was my natural inclination, but, uh, you know, I did some research and I wanted to be open-minded about it, and come to find out the literature, you know, states, and there's a lot of evidence to support that, you know, female dogs are actually more territorial and more independent um, biologically than male the male dogs. So I thought that was interesting. And then also, like I said, looking at this from a preparedness standpoint, um, the ability to reproduce is huge, especially if I really do believe that I'm going to be in a doomsday or shit hits the fan environment at some point. You know, I may not have the ability just to go out and buy another dog, right? But having a female gives has the ability and it opens the door to breeding and you know, having more, having more dogs if I need them. And I think it was ultimately a, a good call to go with the female. We have found a lot of other pedigreed Malazar breeds in the area that, uh, that are open to, you know, doing a stud service for us. And it's allowed us to meet other um, Malazar uh, owners in the area. So it's been really good. And I'm really happy about that. Uh, another great thing is I don't have to worry about marking. Um, male dogs love to mark everything. So I, I do appreciate that, you know, my female doesn't do that. So, you know, I don't think that I compromised anything with the female. I think they're just as capable as their male as their male counter counterparts. And, you know, our female, she's very protective, she's very loyal, and she's very capable. So ultimately, you know, that's why I decided to go with, with the female Malazar. So if I had to summarize this all together, I would use the words of the ancient Roman poet Critias. What if you choose to penetrate even among the Britons? How great your reward, how great your gain beyond any outlays. If you were not bent on looks and deceptive graces, at any rate, when serious work has come, when bravery must be shown, and the impetuous war gods call in the utmost hazard, then you cannot admire the renowned Malazar so much. And I think those words perfectly embody what it is that the Malazar breed does, is, and what they're capable of. Because at the end of the day, guys, when it really comes down to it, when the chips are down, work needs to be done, the mission seems impossible, and you have to depend on something, and you have to depend on someone, when all other measures are exhausted, I want a Malazar dog by my side. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. That's what they have been bred for. That's what they do. When you need hard work done and you need the impossible to happen, this dog shows up. So there you have it. I hope you guys like the video, like the conversation. If you guys have any questions, leave them in the you know, comment section below. If you guys disagree with my assessment, please let me know. Tell me, tell me what you think. Like I said, I know that these... You know, these breeds are not for everybody and they're not for everybody's situation. Um, but for what I do on my homestead and for what I need them for, like I said, I, I don't think I don't think I could choose a better um, type of dog than the Malazar breed for my doomsday. But like I said, every everything's open to, you know, interpretation. But for me, the choice is 100 percent is 100 percent clear and I couldn't be happier. But like I said, I look forward to seeing you guys in the comment section below. Hope you guys have a great day. Hope you guys are hanging in there. And 
as always, guys, as always, long live the Republic.